Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Welcome to the Startup Studios podcast with Seth and Raj. How are you doing, Raj? Oh, man, I can't complain. It's beautiful weather in Seattle right now. <laughs> Rainy and cold. <laughs> Yeah, even uh, in out in the Bay, uh, where our our guest is also from. So I'm I'm super excited to invite my friend and um, uh, somebody who I've actually looked forward to um, or, or sent a lot of uh, kind of deals be before to and and spoken to in terms of health tech, Fahad disease. Uh, Fahad, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, and so Raj, uh, to give you a little back uh, background, so imagine it's 2015. I'm working at F50, which was this uh, venture capital like startup startup community where I was doing the weekly kind of uh, startup events around town. And Fahad and I are part of the same uh, Pakistani entrepreneurship uh, community called Open. Um, and at the time, Fahad was working on a startup called Care Merge, which we're going to get into a little more detail uh, later on, but. Back then, when I was looking for people in the health tech space to, uh, you know, early stage founders who I could not only bring to the investor events, but then also somebody to kind of talk about their, his experience, uh, Fahad was towards the top of my list. So I'm, I'm super excited to get this story out. So Fahad, um, thank you so much for, for joining us. A quick kind of introduction with Raj, uh, first off. So um, Raj, you want to take a stab at it? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about what we're doing over at Startup Studios. So kind of backgrounds in finance, professional career, ran a hedge fund for about a uh, 10 decade, 12 years, um, had an exit in 15 and really excited to kind of get into the startup ecosystem here in Seattle. It's never been my my real forte because so most people look at me a non-technical co-founder or non-technical founder. And that kind of went against me. So I uh, kind of leaned into the startup ecosystem in Seattle and started talking to anything and everybody. I mean, brick walls, if they talk back, great, why not? And slowly fell into it. And again, I had a I had a footprint in, in Houston, Texas, where I'm from for about 35 years. So that's a great network. Move across the country and, and you don't really know anybody. It's even harder to get your ideation into revenue off the ground because you don't have that network effect. You don't have that. So I lean into the, um, the you know startup space and I, I've been lucky enough to meet people like you. And, you know, I'm, I'm super excited for to be candid because we have a, a, a digital health and wellness platform as well that we've been working on. And mom, dad, sister, brother, all physicians. So pretty deep healthcare background as well and kind of moving toward the FinTech and tech side. So really excited about it. And, and more importantly, Seth, excited about what we're doing at Startup Studios. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Rod. So, I mean, I, I guess with that, we'll just kind of dive into it. So, so Fahad, thank you. First off, like we like to divide up these episodes. It's long form for a reason because we want to really get to know the person um, uh, who we're interviewing. So first off, we'll start off with like, who is Fahad Aziz, please? Well, uh, just another uh, person, uh, you know, taking a little bit more calculated risk in life. Uh, my my background is in technology for over twenty years. Uh, I lived my uh, first part of my uh, life in uh, Middle East, uh, in uh, Riyadh, um, and uh, after I think it was, it was seventh grade, uh, that my dad decided to quit his job and move back to Pakistan and. Uh, build a school for girls. Mm -hmm. So very entrepreneurial of him uh, to quit a full-time job. He was working with GE at that time uh, and then do a, a startup uh, in that sense. So he did that. And the first few years were really difficult because uh, he had to build everything from ground up, uh, get the land, build the building, get the first 10, 20, 30 students and teachers and all that stuff, right? So we saw his journey. Uh, while I was doing my uh, uh, high school. And uh, once I did my high school, um, I, I went to Lahore uh, for my undergrad. So uh, there's a university called FAST uh, in Lahore. So I was uh, uh, in the CS program for a good uh, three years. At that point, they only had used to have three years degree. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, so uh, for me, it was a bigger city. I was coming from Peshawar, which is much smaller. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I had a lot more time because I had no family over there, just uh, just college and friends, right? So I started to read this, uh, I found this uh, book uh, on a technology called Pearl. So I started reading that and, and was trying to practice and build websites. Mm -hmm. And this is back in 1997, nice. right? And then someone in the college campus, this is my second semester, 
posted that uh, this is a, the company a startup is looking for a uh, web developer in Perl. And no one knew it. I knew it because I was practicing. So I signed up for it. Mm -hmm. And I, I joined that startup uh, uh, in my second semester. Mm -hmm. And we were like 10 or 15 people. Uh, and the, this, I, sorry, this was in Pakistan still? Like a startup yep. in Pakistan. Wow. Yep. Like early, early days. Very early days. And I was still in college, mm -hmm. uh, my second semester. So by the time I graduated in three years, that startup also grew exponentially. Mm -hmm. So from three, they, we became 300 and they went public on the NASDAQ, right? So, so for me, I was like, maybe this is the life of every company, right? You just start and grow and then go public. Mm -hmm. Little did I know that it's not every company's fate. Uh, but for me, it was a great experience. So by the time I graduated, this company was now listed on NASDAQ. Uh, they had all their operations in Pakistan, um, but they did an acquisition in Germany. And uh, they asked me to move there to help with that acquisition. So I went to Frankfurt, uh, lived there for a couple of months. I didn't like it. And then I got a uh, opportunity in New York. So 2001, I, I came to New York. Wow. Okay. That's, uh, that, no, that's amazing. So, yeah. well, let, let's kind of go, you, you uh, kind of um, alluded to this early on, but like what, what brought about the interest in like web designs and just engineering in general early on? Yeah, I think uh, uh, I would uh, say because of my dad, you know, we were in third grade, fourth grade, when he got us a computer. Uh, and the computer didn't have games. I remember it used to have these uh, software to create print, create printouts, posters. And you guys may not know this because it was back 90s. Uh, the software, what I called Print Master and others, where you can design and get a printout. So, so since then, you know, being started using computers, when we went back to Pakistan, you know, he took the computer with him and that was, uh, for us, that was a uh, everyday thing. You know, we would go to school, come back, and just try something on the computer. Mm -hmm. So we we were very uh, we started using computer very early. Yeah, that's awesome. And so um, at this stage, when you know the the company that you were working with straight out of college, you you've seen what success looks like and and what scale really looks like, and you're still pretty young at this point. I'm assuming you've gone. And at this point, you're in New York. So kind of guide us through where you are at in life at this stage. And was this the point where you started thinking about doing your own startup or your own company or where were you at? Yeah. So before I moved to um, New York, uh, you know, when I was in college uh, and was working with this company, you know, I also had to do a final year project uh, that was a requirement for the degree. So I somehow ended up picking a project because all my friends left me and I had one day to decide a project. So I came up with this crazy idea that I'm going to build a virtual reality shopping arcade, multi-user, all the fancy things that you can think about. I put that in my final year project proposal. All right. And, uh, and then I started working on it. So uh, I actually built that whole program. So it was uh, it's a VR um, run on a Netscape browser uh, where you would uh, be able to interact with other people and shop and the 3D environment very early uh, for VR. Uh, but I built that. So when I uh, came to New York, you know, that became a reason for my employer to hire me because he was so impressed by that project. Uh, it was very difficult to get a uh, visa, a work visa from Pakistan. But because of that project and the prizes that it won, uh, you know, it became very, created a strong case for me to come to New York. So when I came to New York and I started working with uh, a mid-sized company, um, you know, I always have this uh, whole thing about the, the first startup going public. So I tried to do two startups uh, in a span of six years. Uh, I built an e-commerce website for digital cameras. And the second one was I built a algorithmic uh, trading box to uh, to do to buy and sell shares uh, using uh, algorithms, right? So those two startups, uh, I spent a lot of time 
to build them and both of them uh, failed. Uh, the second one failed because of uh, bad timings because I started working on that product in 2006 mm -hmm. and I launched the product in 2008. Oops. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and it was using some of the shortcomings of the whole financial system. So there were some gaps uh, that people were, uh, loopholes that people were using to make money. And we, we took those and programmed it into an algorithm. So when, when the market crashed in 2008, those were the first loopholes that were shut down, right? And as a result, it was a useless system. But I think the problem was that I uh, personally spent like almost two years writing the code for that uh, for the system, and uh, I I really felt uh, betrayed. I'm like, you know what? My co-founder didn't lost anything, right? They just walked away. Mm. The promise was they're going to launch it, they're going to run it, they're going to fund it, but. Uh, not, they haven't done anything yet, and uh, I spent my two years. So uh, from that point, I said, you know, listen, maybe this whole uh, startup thing is not my thing. Mm -hmm. Just and, to, sorry, just to make sure we're we're following along yeah. very well, right? So is this at the end of this like six year period of of you trying these two companies that yeah. you're like push, second questioning? So so before we we get in there, right? I I'd love to hear a little more about. So you said. You spent two years on this uh, this uh, trading algorithm um, startup, uh, but then uh, a, a little to, or tell us a little about this e-commerce uh, startup as well. Sure. And real quick, actually, Fahad, if if you don't mind, because I'd like a little bit of context, because candidly, I think it's so apropos as well. And and hopefully, I'm not trying to you know derail the conversation, but it's so apropos because I remember in '08 and '09, you know, price discovery, especially in the financial markets, kind of went out the window because central banks started talking. When yeah. central banks start manipulating and price discovery goes out, those exigent circumstances are outside of your control. Yeah. Code can be the most brilliant, elegant thing. It can be perfect with all the algorithms, but you're now having a variable you cannot control. And that's yeah. actually making it something that's a death knell. And yeah. I think, again, that's so interesting for startups. You're like, great, I have this idea. And it can be industry agnostic. Cool, here's my electric car but now california is saying actually we're going to ban all electric cars and you're sitting there and you're like well but we had such a great idea and i yeah. think founders don't understand because i know it's happened to me there are exigent mm -hmm. exigent circumstances you just can't control yeah and the pivot gets thrown out the window so i think it's a really interesting thing that specifically to your use case and and how founders see this failure Listen, you you went so far and then price discovery left because central banks, when they start talking and moving markets, you have no idea what lies they're or not they're gonna say. So right. again, the natural market is broken. Yeah, absolutely. So there are few things that are not in your control. Yes. But I think what was in my control and that made me feel betrayed at that point was that I didn't sign a good uh, uh, understanding with my co-founders, right? There were no clear conditions, terms. Or expectations. Yeah. And the whole point was that, you know, Fahad, you build it and we will launch it. It's mm -hmm. as simple as that, right? And uh, that's not how startups are built, right? Yeah. Someone taking all the risk and when it's time to de-risk, then they come in and they uh, enjoy the benefits. So that was a huge learning. Mm -hmm. And also that uh, that whole feel of betrayal uh, that, you know, I did everything and where were these guys when I needed them to launch the product. And outside of the betrayal, did you find any solace? In, and I'm projecting here because I've I've been in the same spot. Did you find any solace? in like, listen, it didn't work because of something out of my control. Or do founders think that way? Like, nope, I, I failed. Yeah, honestly, at that point, that's not how I felt that uh, this is not in my control because uh, the co-founders just walked uh, away. My biggest concern at that point was, can we pivot it? You know, let's change it to make it work. Uh, but uh, they were in the space. Uh, they were the ones who got uh, to shut down their operations. So they had nothing left to offer. Mm -hmm. uh, looking back, I can say I can understand their position. Uh, but at that point, no. <laughs> it's very difficult going through it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate no, awesome. Just to clarify. No, thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you for for clarifying that. So, um, okay, we're we're coming back to 
you're you're feeling all these different mm -hmm. emotions. Mm -hmm. You're you're kind of feeling the weight because you know I I can't really imagine because you've mm -hmm. already tasted a lot of the the success. I'm I'm imagining you could have your your pick of jobs, mm -hmm. you know, whether in the U.S. or or abroad. Like and you've you've gone through this uh, this emotional kind of you know roller coaster. Where are you at at this stage, and what are you what are you going through? Yeah. So um, so once that happened in two thousand eight, uh, I decided to quit this whole startup, uh, pursue it, and focus on my job. And I did that for another two three years. Uh, enjoyed traveling and did everything just like a another nine to five. Yeah. Um, but then came another point in my life where I started to get the itching yeah. uh, to do it. And uh, this time, you know, I started looking at the mistakes I made. Uh, and I said, okay, this is what I did wrong. But if I do it this time, I'll try not to make those mistakes, right? Um, one of them was, you know, finding a solid co-founder, right? Second one was uh, uh, doing it full time, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to do it part time. Uh, uh, so those were two major ones. And then the third one was, uh, you know, uh, full focus, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Quit everything else that's going on. So, uh, so I decided to leave my job. I decided to leave New York City. Uh, we moved to a uh, suburbs in Chicago. Met uh, with the co-founder. And uh, we started building the third company. Um, this time it was in healthcare, uh, which was very new to me. My co-founder had much more experience in healthcare than I did. And, uh, but the, the, the challenge that we started to solve, we initially wanted to build like a Facebook for healthcare. Um, but uh, again, a few weeks into it, you know, we started to realize that uh, that's a bad idea. Uh -huh. And it, this was 2011, 2012, right. right? So still pretty early for social social media. Yeah, it was 2011, <laughs> but Facebook was popular. Everyone was signing up. Uh, so we wanted to create a version of uh, so Facebook for healthcare. So, so soon we realized that's not going to work. No one wants to talk about their sickness or medications with their friends, right? If you look back 2011, you didn't know how you're going to use the Facebook, right? There was a common uh, impression that, you know, you're just going to share everything as is. But it turns out that's not the case, right? Everyone just puts their best uh, uh, on Facebook. So uh, so we, we, we started to realize that's not going to work. Uh, there's no opportunity to make money. Um, it's very difficult to get the data and so on. So we started looking at other problems and uh, we got a chance to spend a couple of weeks in a senior living community. Right. So we were there for a couple of weeks, day and night. We started to shadow nurses, uh, uh, family members, residents. And we saw there was a lot of friction between all of them. You know, every time family member would come in, she's always upset, unhappy, saying, you didn't, don't take care of my dad. my dad. My dad is in the room for three hours. No one called him. And when you talk to the uh, staff member, they're like, you know, we are working, we're taking care of them, but we don't have time to tell the family members, right? So if they get this impression, we just cannot do anything about it. So we say, okay, there's an opportunity. You know, why don't we build a system where we can send automated messages and updates to the family members, right? Wow. So this way nurses can do what they do, staff can do what they do, but we'll get the family members through technology updated, mm -hmm. right? So we started building that product and that community turned out to be our first paying customer. And uh, so, so we launched the product uh, 2012, right? Um, and we raised, uh, at that point, I think we had 30, $40,000. Um, but when we, uh, we got a few customers, then we were able to raise another 300 to $400,000 from family and friend awesome. around. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, so we started selling and then uh, we hit another roadblock, which was that uh, back in 2012 and 13, the senior living communities did not have Wi-Fi in the buildings, right? Or many of the staff members didn't even have smartphones. Yeah. Or they weren't allowed to bring them inside. <laughs> they were not allowed to bring them inside or they cannot use the, their personal devices, 
And uh, now adoption was a huge challenge. How do we get uh, the staff member to use it, right? That's one side of the problem. Uh, the other side of the problem was the communities were saying that this is more like a vitamin. Yeah, it does solve our problems, but it doesn't solve real problems that we are having. And we're like, what's the real problem? And they're like, well, the real problems are more clinical, medications, care plans, uh, compliance, and all that stuff. So can you also give us those features, which is called EHR, electronic health record? And we being a scrappy entrepreneur, we say, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll build that in three months, right? So next three years, we build that. <laughs> we spent three years building it. Um, so, so we did that and, you know, um, so we, so I, uh, now we were doing fundraising and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's always a disadvantage to do fundraising when you're not in uh, West Coast, right? We were in Chicago, uh, which is still not West Coast, right? So we started to have a lot of challenges uh, getting our first series A. Uh, but luckily, you know, I had a friend in, in Dubai uh, who reached out and said, you know, if you, if I can help you with the fundraising. So we engaged with him. And then within like uh, six weeks, you know, we closed like $2.1 million over series nice. A. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. There are many that uh, investment came from uh, one person uh, <laughs> wow. from uh, Poland. Uh, she she wrote the check, uh, but that gave us a lot of uh, momentum because awesome. now we had uh, customers, we had a product, and uh, we had closed a large round. Yeah. Two point one million back in two thousand fourteen is like ten million now. Yeah, and how big was your team at the time? Um... Yeah, when we closed the round, I think we were like um, five, uh, four or five in operations. And then uh, we were around like uh, 10, 15 in engineering. That's awesome. So, well, talk us through like, well, usually people don't really understand like how long it takes. You know, you, you took the time to actually go to your customers, uh, live in the uh, in that space and really immerse yourself in the problem, right? Like talk us through from start to like the initial MVP phase, because a lot of our, our people come to us and ask like, Hey, we need co-founders or we need engineers mm -hmm. or we need, uh, you know, to create some fancy kind of prototype or product. Like talk us through that stage because you guys actually got successful. You were able to raise friends and family and then uh, seed in series A, like, but how was that progression over the years? Yeah. And actually, so, Fahad, if you if you don't mind, because he makes such a great point, but there's almost a little bit before, Seth, because you went in there with your co-founder, correct? Yes. Do you think the co-founders from the tech from the finance company would have done the same thing? And I'm I'm projecting maybe not, but you took such an important time. And you you hit on something to me that was really important because Seth mm -hmm. did this when I first met Seth. When Seth and I were working, thinking about working together, he said, here, here's a 50 questionnaire founder to founder. Here's mm -hmm. a question for you. Here's a question for me. Hey, when Raj gets stressed out, what does Raj do? Does he mm -hmm. start drinking and stay in bed and he's not a co-founder? And I think that's so important. And then you said you took a, you audited your mistakes and then, you know, we're going to work with a lot of people because you mentioned, Seth, people will be looking for co-founders. What was before you even got in that place with your new co-founder, which obviously worked because he took the time with you to do the customer discovery, which is wildly important. What was that? And, and again, it doesn't have to be extremely, you know, bespoke yeah. and, and, and breakdown, but you obviously had a thought process of how you wanted to get to your next co-founder. You said, here are my mistakes. What was maybe one big thematic thing of people are looking for co-founders? What was like that one thing you're like, this is my, my my bright line, I won't, you know, budge. Yeah, I think the most important one is your gut feeling. <laughs> you know, you, you cannot say no to that. You know, when you meet somebody and consider that person as a, as a potential co-founder, you know, spend some time with him or her to understand, you know, how he, she works, talk to his referrals. And the best thing you can do is that before you go in a formal engagement, spend like a couple of weeks without uh signing up any document right say listen we have to work this together we have to build a billion dollar company 
right? And we'll have to go through thick and thin together, yeah. right? So well, let's spend like a couple of weeks together and let's see if I'm a good fit for you and you're a good fit for me, right? And in that couple of weeks, uh, you, you, I think you will have a great understanding whether what, what, uh, what works, what doesn't work. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that even if you do that, there's a good chance that uh, six months into it, you don't have, you have not raised money and it's getting really difficult and the person can quit, yep. right? And not just because that person has other plans, it's just that his financial situation doesn't support him or something changed, right? It's natural. So the way you secure and protect yourself is that you put a vesting period in the equity, in the stock options, right? So this way, if if she leaves six months into the engagement, she only earns the six months of the work that she did. And yep. you have the remaining that you can give to the next co-founder. Great. Right? So so those those are the two things. Um, third, you know, not possible, but if it is, you know, always try to find people that you have worked with in before to be your co-founders. Yeah. And... Uh, I don't mean that uh, find your friends and cousins and all those guys because that that it has to be on merit. Mm -hmm. It has to be on merit, a hundred percent. But it's just that uh, if you have worked with that person, uh, then then uh, it works out really well. And then the final how, how think, long did you sorry to cut you off? How long did you know your eventual co-founder before you guys started working together? So I didn't know him. Uh, well, I knew him for a couple of months, maybe. Yeah. But uh, we had a strong connection in between. Mm-hmm. Who 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 made the uh, high recommendation? He was my best friend, and he was his uh, very close family member. So okay. we trusted uh, each other's. Uh, yeah. To the on the, the last conduit, point, the I medium, think, yeah. the medium you right. trusted him. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then the last point is, which is the most important one, is that you know, building a startup. It's like building an empire, right? It's it's a very long term. Yeah. You you may not hear about startup or starting and selling in three years. That's very rare, right? It takes five, 10 years to build a startup, right? So the person that's joining you needs to understand this is a long-term relationship. Mm-hmm. And things may go wrong and you may not uh, agree with the other person, but you're not into this for something small, you're into this for a 10 year journey. So you'll have to forgive, forget, move on, you know? So so if you're working for a bigger cause and these little things that happens every day, he didn't call me, he had an interview, but he went ahead by himself and didn't let me know. Mm-hmm. He's just taking all the fame, I'm doing all the work, all the things, you know, just put it on the side, you're all working towards building that big organization. The goal is so big that little things, mm-hmm. just, Put it on the side. Put your ego, your emotions away mm-hmm. for your cause. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. No, thank you for that. That was a, that was a good good segment. But so so now, okay, we've got the co-founder relationship. We're doing customer discovery. How did you guys decide like the initial prototype? What 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 did it do? And how, like, were there a lot of complaints? Did it break down? Yeah. Like, what were those challenges early on? Yeah. So my co-founder had a really interesting strategy. So he was a six uh, sigma black belt. Um, so, uh, and they are problem solvers, right? So they would go into an organization and look at the process and say, this is broken, right? We go in and look at the process. We say, well, it's working. So that's the best it can work. Mm-hmm. So wh- one of the strategy that uh, we used was uh, six wise. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll go and say, hey, why are you upset uh, about this? And she said, well, because of that. He said, why because of that? He said, well, because it always happens like this. We said, why does it always happen like this? So by the time you get to the five, fifth or sixth why, you actually get to the root of the problem, right? Mm. Because on the surface, she'll tell you something else. You know, she said, you know, I'm upset because family members are always upset at me. And you're like, why are they upset at you? Well, because they don't know what I'm doing. Why are they don't know what you're doing? You get my point, right? So that's that's one strategy, but there are several other strategies to get to the root of the problem, right? How uh, wildly, how wildly simple and effective. Like mm-hmm. honestly, just how wildly, wildly simple yet effective. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Super cool. Yeah. Get to the root because you want to solve the root problem. You don't want to solve the 
something that on the surface looks bigger, but it's not. Right. So that that would that uh, Seth, does that answer your question? You know, that's how yeah. we were doing that exercise while we were there and asking yeah. a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Now looking back, uh, I can say there was one fatal mistake we made, um, and that was lack of our experience. And maybe at that time, that was not very uh, widely understood. But today, I if I would do it again, I would not make that mistake. The mistake we made was that you know. We were looking for any opportunity, any problem, and wanted to solve it, hmm. right? And as we, and if someone comes in and say we're going to pay for it, we're going to jump on it, right? But today, if you want to solve a problem, you have to take a different route and say, okay, how big is the tab? How big is the market size? How big is the uh, serviceable address addressable market? Uh, if I do everything correct, can I make a unicorn? Uh, is this for a certain niche, certain area, certain country, certain vertical, or is this for everybody, right? And then make a decision whether you want to solve this problem, right? Okay. I have I talked to so many founders today who would come and say, hey, uh, I was at Google and uh, the performance review was very broken. So I'm going to build this app to do the performance reviews for employees, right? Great idea because he saw that idea. And he said, I talked to the HR and she said she will pay for it. But look at the market size. You know, does other HR software can do that? They are doing this. Is this a small component of the big one? If you sell it to everybody, how much is gonna, how much money you're gonna make? And on and on, right? So that that we didn't do, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I recommend startups to do to now, you know. And and if you find out that it's a small market and you wanna still serve it, that's fine. Then there will be no expectation tomorrow that oh shit I cannot make a billion dollar company. Yeah, no that that's uh, that, that's really good insight. Like so um, the 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 first version of your product rather I think let's let's switch it up. How long did that last you before you guys like introduced version two or something you know completely fleshed out and and better? Yeah, no, it we continue to sell that product. Uh, we sign some large customers. Um, we did change our focus as we pivoted into clinical, mm -hmm. uh, but that that kept uh, uh, so that that was uh, customers were kept using it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, we didn't That's we didn't nice. shelve that project. Yeah, and um, did was it just like did you guys have eventual situations where you had to consider like completely a new direction or a complete pivot from the initial, let's say series A, series B side, or was it smooth sailing afterwards? Uh, no smooth sailing. <laughs> <laughs> what? So, so that's the other mistake we made, you know, um, as a scrappy entrepreneur, you know, we believe that uh, if we cannot sell what we have built, then we build more. Hmm. Right. So say that uh, again. Say that again, Fahad. <laughs> say it again. Yeah. Let's put more features. Why? Yeah. Because that will sell, right? So we we didn't trust what we were building. We were we were always ah, questioning. Right? The conviction level. Right. So here's what happened. Good thing happened, and also something really bad happened. We started growing horizontally. Because mm -hmm. we started building software for senior homes, for pharmacy, for hospital, for doctors. Everyone was using some aspect of our platform. And we were serving all of them, and they were all paying. Right? So we built a whole care coordination platform. Right? So we started with a very small focus, but now we have a care coordination platform. Sounds great? Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. That what impressed the investors because they started to realize that we can take over the world because this is not a one style of system. So, but we were growing horizontally. We were not getting customers like this, mm -hmm. right? And from team perspective, we were in a very difficult situation because we had three engineers on one, four engineers on two, five engineers on this, two engineers on that, one salesperson there. But we were like spreading like this. And none of the customers were happy because there was no focus, right? So, so, so we were able to close the round 
Uh, this time, I think we rose 4 million. Uh, but now we got ourselves into a really big problem that we don't know what to sell, like which one has more traction. And who to sell to? Who to sell to? Which conference should we go? Should we go to the hospitals conferences? Or should we go to senior homes? Or should we go to the doctor's physician's offices? Right? Yep. Wow. We can't go everywhere. And then the biggest, other bigger problem that we started facing was over in, uh, perception in the market. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, we were like everywhere, everything, and we were like nobody. Right? The companies would say, I thought you were software for hospital. Yep. Oh, no, no. I thought you, I heard you were selling into that pharmacy. Right? Yeah. So that was another perception issue that we started facing that, you know, we, we don't, we don't have an identity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, even if you look at today, startups, that is the common mistake they make. Yes. They always grow and they say, you know, they build a software for, let's say, HR. And then the HR say, you know what, this is great, but can you also do payroll? And then they started the payroll. And when they're doing the payroll, someone comes in and say, your oh, payroll is really good. Can you also incorporate IT aspect in it? And by the, and startup, by the time they realize two years into it, they have like six major components that can work, sell individually and not work, helping each other. So, but it does help one, that one customer that made you do it. <laughs> <laughs> that made you build that custom solution. But Fahad, that, so, that's so, on, again, that's so important for people to understand and, and, and say it again, because especially, let's say your first year, your first X, your first MRR, you're, you're hitting 20, 25 and you can't see really past your nose of the deep mm -hmm. vertical. It's more like, cool, I can get to 50 MRR. I can get 100 MRR. But then you're running the gamut and you're generic. And God forbid somebody comes in, the competitor does a doppelganger, does what you do with a little bit more cash behind them. We'll do that. And then, you know, I, I also look from the very, uh, towards the end of this journey, where now I have to sell the company. And that's also a huge problem because the buyers right. are coming in and say, I want a solution for senior living. Yeah. But, you know, you have these three other products that I don't want. Yeah. And your revenue is coming from three sources. I don't care about the other two. Yeah. Right. So now how do we uh, sell the company? That's a big mess. Right. So, uh, so that's also a way to think about when you're building the product that, you know, when you're going to exit, the company, the buyer is not looking for everything. You'll be lucky if you right. find one, mm -hmm. but they're usually looking for one product or multiple products with huge traction. Right. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I mean, how how did the um, so you know it, 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 it before you guys got acquired? How many rounds of funding had you raised? Yeah, we went all the way up to Series D. All right. Yeah. So the check, the kind check of, size was small, but uh, we yeah. did went to multiple. Yeah. Ones. So so a lot of people kind of think that the the fundraising strategy and uh, the methodology is exactly the same per round. Can you mm -hmm. kind of tell us a little more about like, um, you know, you mentioned that you had raised the seed round, um, uh, had built, you know, really good product, and then Series A, because of the, even though the product was bloated or uh, a little more than what you needed, um, it was able to convince Series A investors, right? Like, can you tell us a little about mm -hmm. what your and your co-founder strategy was at the beginning and how it changed with the fundraising over time? Yeah, I think every fundraising is different. Uh, you cannot say uh, it's the uh, same. When you're doing it for the first time, it's an open field. Anybody can come in um, and you can, and it's a long process, don't get me wrong. It can take a couple of months, maybe half a year. And, uh, uh, and you have to meet like 50 to 80 VCs before you find the one or two that's interested. So it's a long process, but what happens in the second round is not it's not an open field because now you have previous investors who are invested and who have a say, right? They're either board members or they have voting rights or whatnot. So that does limit your capability of raising. They they always have an opinion, <laughs> right? Uh, I don't think this is a good VC. I don't think you should pay attention to them. I don't don't like this valuation, right? Uh, and so on. So. So the more the later it gets, the more complex complicated it gets. Right. Yeah, makes sense. So with 
like the initial seed round because you said you would raise family and friends how Im did you use like more of a spray and pray kind of approach or, or did you use kind of a broker or did you just try to go around yourselves and build a long-term relationship and and Fahad if you could also sprinkle on in there yeah. perfect question Seth but it's a great segue into when did you actually realize, okay, because I think a lot of founders, a lot of founders is where do we cross that Rubicon of being like, all right, now's the time to go raise. Because candidly, outside of the spray and pray friends mm -hmm. and family, it's that juxtaposition of dilution, MRR, mm -hmm. what am I doing? What do I want to do? Is now the time? My dad says I'm not doing well. My dog yeah. is not like, yeah, I think uh, in any financial round uh, finan uh, financing, the key is that you need to show a momentum. Because what the investor is looking at that in last couple of months or quarters, how did you grow, right? And have enough momentum that their money is going to take it to the top, right? So let's say you go to investor and in last six months, you have not closed any deal, right? Uh, and last year was last year in June. That doesn't give them enough validation or uh, conviction in your product, right? They're like, I don't know why they haven't closed any their month. So the timing to think about is, is that you have to smartly plan it and say, okay, it feels like I'm gonna, I have closed a lot of deals or I have acquired a lot of customers or I have a lot of adoption of the users in the last six months because of whatever reason. And I do expect that to continue for another three, six months. This is the time to raise money. Because after three months, something is going to happen and I lose customer, the churn will be high. I may not be able to go to uh, uh, investor and convince them, right? So you have to very properly time it uh, when you want to do the fundraising, right? That, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a little sense of like how long it took in between rounds or usually people yeah. automatically assume it's like 12 months, but um, were there any hiccups? Yeah, I think we did every two years. Uh, so 2014, I know, sorry, 12, 14, and 16. Yeah, every two years. Mm -hmm. uh, the 2 million, 4 million, 14 million. Yeah. Yes. So um, I think we we last kind of ended on like where things were at Series A. Kind of walk us through Series A through Series D, please, and then exit. Like what what were things like? And were, were it, was, was things smoother or, you know, different challenges? Yeah. Um, so after the series A, you know, we were able to build the team, grow the team, and that really helped scale. Um, we were building more features now. We had a very, uh, we have a bigger engineering team, uh, and that helped us also with new customers coming in. We were able to secure or the first venture funding of uh, $4 million, right? Um, and now we have more muscle. So we continue building on top of that. And uh, that helps us secure the 14 million because we find some large customers uh, between that, that period. Yeah. Uh, and we also were able to deliver on some of the uh, uh, commitments or promises that we made earlier. So that, that helps build the credibility because the new uh, investors would also talk to your previous investors. So you need to have that uh, credibility in place. And, and again, you know, while you were still getting the clients that was translating into the MRR the, to revenue as well, or was it like, because I, I think a lot of people, they have this projection of like, Oh, wow, they're, they're growing with user base or contracts or whatever, but the monetization is wildly different than the relationship. Right. So it also depends on business to business. If you're in marketplaces or B2C, maybe traction uh, can, uh, can be enough. But if you are in right. a SaaS product, Mm -hmm. uh, then there's no such thing as traction. The only traction is the revenue and MRR, right? Right. So uh, absolutely varies. Uh, but not all the investors would come in on the ARR or MRR, right? Sometimes they will come in under seeing the whole world, the whole problem that you're solving, right? They believe in it right. and they want to support that uh, and so on. The only other point on the fundraising is that, you know, um, it could be a blessing um, uh, to get that much money, uh, but it could also be a huge problem, right? Because, you know, I remember when we closed our largest round, 
uh, it took us a couple of months to close it. And that night we celebrated, we went to, uh, uh, with the team and enjoyed. And next morning was a Saturday morning and me and my co-founder woke up and were like, what the hell? Are we <laughs> it all hit. Yeah. It all hit. Uh, we have so much in cash. How are we going to scale the business, right? Who do we hire? Mm -hmm. uh, do we need like 10 salespeople, marketing, product? Is everything ready? Mm -hmm. Right? And it was not. Right? Our product was at that point not ready for commercialization. Mm -hmm. Right? So we had to figure all that out with the money that we raised. Ideally, we should have figured it out before the money we raised. So that as soon as the money comes in, we just put it and scale. Mm -hmm. So that took us another six months to burn a lot of cash, hire crazy people. Our team in Chicago grew from like 10 to 30, 40 uh, in a span of six months. Uh, we actually hired a full-time recruiter. Imagine having a startup as a full-time recruiter in the office because <laughs> we had to expand. We did that too. Uh, so have to be very careful, you know, don't raise so much money that you don't know how to spend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that's so another learning. One one kind of a note on that. So uh, you guys were able to raise like that much money because there, there's some investors nowadays who ask like, you know, hey, send me your financials, send me the projections as if, you know, you're supposed to have everything figured out. You've seen fundraisers considering your own experience a couple of years ago, but then compared today, is that a major or have, have things kind of shifted or is it still very much the same? I think it's still very much the same. You know, investors are still looking for good opportunities, right? And uh, I, I believe the, there's much more inbound for investors, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many startups now. Uh, than they were uh, at that time, right? So that may have changed things on their side. You know, how do you filter them? You don't have time. Mm -hmm. In the past, you know, if you send an email, a cold email to a VC, they will never respond to that, right? You have to go through a reference. Mm -hmm. That is still the case today. But even through references, you're now getting such a high volume. Okay. Now, what do you do, mm -hmm. right? So the more you prepare, so the way we we were told and it really worked was that when you go in front of an investor, there should not be any red flags that you know of in your pitch, right? You, you cannot go in there because he's gonna pick one thing and rest is gone. No more discussion, you're out. Mm -hmm. Your job is to take care of all the red flags so that you leave that meeting, he says, okay, he, they have everything. Now I just need to think about whether it's a good fix for me. Mm -hmm. Right. So, for instance, you know, you go in there and the red flag is that there's only one founder. That's a red flag. No one wants to invest in a startup with one founder. You go in there and the red flag is that there is no, no customer acquisition in the last three months. That's a red flag. He's going to he is going to bring it up. <laughs> and and you're going to be in a very difficult conversation. Right. So so try to get rid of all the known red flags before you go into a presentation. Mm -hmm. Nice. So, yeah, that's a really good good point. Like, I'll just think a little more in terms of what the follow up questions could be. Um, oh, that's you talk but... to a lot of uh, investors uh, who are angel investors to get uh, to practice. Yeah. Because the question doesn't change much. Uh, angel investors are going to ask a lot of questions. VCs are going to ask the same questions. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> a few more. But but the, by the time you get to a good VC, you have to be presenting your to at least 10, 15 angels. Yeah. to clean up your side deck. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting there too is I, we actually would, took it one step further. We went and talked to VCs we knew wouldn't come in. We knew for a fact they wouldn't come in. So we, we wanted them to be the red team. We're like, hey, listen, mm -hmm. we're not part of your scope of, of your portfolio. We get it. Here's what we're doing. What would you be like? Eh, eh, eh. Because they're, no. they're not, they're coming for advice. They know that they're not getting pitched and, and you come up to, to completely diffusing yeah. the situation of like listen we're deep we 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 know like we're healthcare we know your web3 nfts but what would you poke holes in and it worked mm -hmm. wildly effective for us mm -hmm. yeah well, good point. when you when you do get like pitches and stuff right you it it's just impossible not to put that hat on and you know be like this is 
my scope or or my ethos yeah. that I need to filter these proposals in. But um, the only problem with that approach is Raj is that you know they're not interested. But you know if you get them excited, you know they can in, open doors for other VCs that are interested. Of course, right? absolutely. So every pitch you go in, you go in with uh, with perfect preparation. Hoping that they will come and invest, even knowing that they may not. Mm -hmm. But yeah. uh, if they get impressed, uh, they will open doors for you. And that's how the VC uh, fundraising works. You know, one VC will not invest, but he will let you into the door of somebody who will. Yep. Awesome. Happened today, actually. We were working with a VC group and they're like, listen, we love what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You're B2B to C in a snowflake. We just, our mandate to our LPs is B2B, but go talk to this person over here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wild awesome uh all right so yeah we're we're still uh talking about like so series d through exit like what at what stage did you you know as as one of the founders kind of understand like okay things are getting easier like you know just just hold the hold the fort like this is the the plan or was it always like constantly shifting <laughs> he's already looking down this is getting easier <laughs> hold the line what line <laughs> there's no line yeah so that's that's a very interesting experience uh going through an acquisition um and you know you probably heard this you know uh, if you're a founder from zero to one means you have an exit you know you have seen the all aspect the full journey and uh, and that's really important for VCs uh, also because um, when you go all the way to the end, then you look back and say, okay, so this is what the VC was talking about. Okay, this is why that uh, uh, term Wild. was in my contract. This Wild. is what preferred shares mean. Yeah, this is why I want I had to focus on one product and not. You get my point, right? So that, that 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 closure is really important in in your resume, in your life, in your ex wealth of experience. A closure is very important. It could be a painful closure where you shut down the business, right? Or it could be a IPO closure, or it could be an acquisition closure. Regardless, that closure needs to happen, and that that's a huge learning. So, how does the closure happen? Um, there comes a time in your in your company when you start to feel that you know you cannot continue to grow organically or through fundraising, either because there are too many competitors, either because uh, you're uh, uh, there's not a big market size, there's saturation, could be any of the uh, could all of these reasons or maybe some of those reasons. Um, then it's very natural that you know that you decide look start looking for an acquisition right or either do an acquisition or get acquired those are two options right because you're not growing organically now you need to buy more companies or you get acquired right so that that's sort of a natural exit for a b2b SaaS companies if they are doing they have a good arr mm -hmm. um so it came uh uh we started looking at both options also uh but we got some inbound uh, where investor, where buyer came in and said, you know, we're very interested. It complements our solution, and uh, we want we want to acquire the company. Now that that process is a very long process. It can take uh, as much as fundraising time, right? Uh, could be three months, six months, twelve months. In our case, it was actually eighteen months. It was very long. With the same uh, with the same acquirer with multiple acquirers okay. so we did one deal that fell apart and we did a second one um but now this is a very interesting time because you are living two lives right as a founder you're going through this acquisition process you're talking to buyers and negotiating and due diligence and all that crap and then on the other side you're running a business mm -hmm. and you have to put this poker face in front of your team to say nothing is different work as usual we have big goals for next year and all that, right? Yeah. And you have to, and it, it that's very, very uh, stressful. Okay. Wow. <laughs> because uh, you can tell them what's going on, and or on the other side, there's non-going negotiation happening. But uh, you know, we had a really good team. You know, we worked together as one unit, 
and uh, went through that process. And after 18 months, you know, that acquisition successfully That's happened. So hot, real and quick then. So, uh, sorry, just a clarifying question there. So your team, and obviously you weren't being disingenuous, they weren't privy to some of the information. If you could do it again, would you do it any different during those 18 months? Yeah. I would, uh, if we told to, uh, in our core team members, if we told, uh, engage like five, seven or eight people in this process, next time I'll engage three and four. <laughs> Much Keep less. Smaller. Yeah, because at the, at the time when the offer comes in and you accept the offer, there's so much excitement. It feels like it's just going to happen. And you get all the people rallied up in your core team, right? And they get excited, right? And then it doesn't fall through, which is a highly likely chance like any other fundraising. Now, now what, what do you tell them, right? You lose their excitement uh, and so on. So very difficult to keep it to yourself, but... I think that that's one thing I would do. Secondly, I don't know if you can change the timeline or I would go and do something differently. We were very uh, top of our game in terms of delivery, timeline. You know, we, we went through all the stages. Um, so I don't know if I would have done anything differently. And then, so um, walk us through a little like what, Post exit or post acquisition, like what yeah. what were you feeling? Uh, obviously, there there were some ups and downs as well. Um, talk us through how you got prepared for what was next. Yeah. So um, so we decided to announce to the team, and the team was everywhere uh, in the U.S. Uh, and in Pakistan. So we brought most of them into one conference room uh in uh, uh in chicago and uh was a big day you know everyone was there like like 100 plus people and uh that day i got covid that i mm. for sure remember <laughs> i was really down the morning i was trying to get the covid test done and all of that covid test came negative so i was happy that at least i don't have i'm feeling very sick but i don't have covid but those uh, but those are false negative uh, so I went in, met everybody, we made the announcement, and I decided to leave the organization. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, when we were going towards the end of this process, you know, my colleagues were saying, you know, Fahad, you should take some rest after this, you know, don't do anything for a year. Uh, I'm like, no, 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 no. As soon as this closes, I'm going to start uh, working on something else. Uh, but uh, when this shut down, you know, I did uh, take a, took a break. Uh, and uh, that was a wonderful experience, you know, uh, when you don't have to worry about day to day, no, no meetings on the calendar. Uh, yeah, every day you're checking your email, but there's nothing coming in. When you wake up, you're like, if there's any meeting, no meetings, uh, sort of thing. So, uh, but I, but the office we had here, we had it for the for whole year. So I just, so every day I went to the office. Hmm. And I started meeting with a lot of founders and startup founders. Mm -hmm. Also helping them with some integration, but I spent a lot of time with founders. So I met around like 70, 80 founders in the last six months. Um, and they were trying, they were, anyone, anyone who reached out to me on LinkedIn, I, I set up a meeting. And they were hoping that they would learn a lot from me, but I was learning from them, yeah. right? New problems, new challenges, such smart people, their experiences and so on. So it was a great uh, six, seven months uh, since that acquisition. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then, uh, so I know for a fact that you still, um, you know, through Open, so through a few other organizations, do still work with early stage uh, founders and, and startups. Um, can you talk, tell us a little about that? Like, what kind of startups do you enjoy working with? Yeah. So... Um, I think I add most value in startups that are in healthcare because of my experience with 10 years in healthcare. So, uh, so obviously I enjoy talking to them and warning them of what not to do for sure. Uh, but uh, since then, you know, I've, I've talked to uh, startups in every space from uh, 
ad tech, uh, marketing, um, you know, you just name it. Mm -hmm. uh, so variety. Yeah. So I, I just enjoy the, the we know what people are building, the problems that they're solving. Yeah. Really appreciate. You know, it takes it takes a lot to do that. You guys know this. Uh, and sometimes, and you know, being a founder, you're always very lonely, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so yeah, so I enjoy talking to them, you know, helping in any way, opening doors for them. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And and well, I mean, you're you're one of those uh, unicorn founders who also has an engineering or like product background. So um, do you prefer working more with CEOs or CTOs, or is it kind yeah. of across the team? Yeah, not really CTOs. Uh, uh, but enjoy working more with uh, uh, sales, with sales, marketing, product. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. CTO, awesome. I I just feel that you know every every problem can be can be solved with uh, engineers can solve all the problems. <laughs> nice. That doesn't excite me much. <laughs> oh, awesome. Is there is there a like some people prefer dealing with a certain stage of founder, right? Mm -hmm. That they've already raised a little bit of money or have a little bit of traction. Do you do you have like a certain sweet spot uh, where you provide the most value or um, do you like yeah. talking to everybody? Yeah, I think um, I add a lot of value when you have uh, your first uh, million dollar in uh, ARR. Because, you know, one of the problems that... Uh, especially in B2B SaaS, and you probably have seen this, is that you know it's very easy to get the first 100,000 or half a million or million era because the uh, founders is uh, hustling and he's calling and he's using his network. So you can get the first 10, 15, 20, 30 customers, right? Once you get the first customers, now you need to build a marketing engine, sales engine that can create predictable growth. And, and, and startups do not transition into that mode, right? And in the last six months, I have met so many startups like that and I help them transition. Mm -hmm. And so listen, this growing and scaling a business is not a founder's one-off sales thing. You know, you call somebody and she picks up and great. It has to be a proper marketing and sales automation, mm -hmm. right? And like any other SaaS company does. So, so I, I think I add a lot of value. And in the last few months, you know, the companies that, uh, you know, I was able to guide, you know, they were able to transition and I'm enjoying the results. <laughs> awesome. that's, that's so interesting, Seth, because that's exactly where, you know, I, you know, founders are there. And I, it's funny too, because if I'm being radically transparent and, you know, when we go um, talk to investors, hopefully they don't watch this, kidding. Um, it's that penny gap theory. For me, uh, if I was going to medical school, I would be a physician. The ortho does six hips a day. Great. Rinse, wash, repeat. Rinse, wash, repeat. Rinse, wash, repeat. The ER doc is looking at puzzles. Man, okay, what is this? What is this? What is this? The monotony isn't there. As a founder, going from that zero to one and that penny gap is great. Hitting 25, 50K in MR, a million in AR. Going from a million to 10 million or 100 million? Systemization. It's it's pro It's... And some founders, I, I just always find it really interesting because then they'll come and get a real, not real, they'll get a CEO because candidly founders might not be great CEOs. Mm -hmm. You get to the point where you're, you're, you have your cathartic experience of like, I loved what I built and I solved the problem. I like solving problems. I might not want to build a sales engine. And that's radically trans, like that's radically apropos because that's where a lot of them just go to die. Interesting. I, I feel for a B2B SaaS companies, uh, you know, the best combination is that you have a CTO and a CMO as a co-founders. Because from day one, you need to start thinking about marketing. How are you going to sell? Are you going to go on the marketplace? Are you going to partner? Are you going to white label? Are you going to do all that? Are you going to sell on the website? Are you going to go to product hunt? Right? And then design the product so that it can do all that stuff, right? Is it an API uh, thing, right? But if you build a product and two years later, you hire the first marketing officer or head of sales, and he does exercise, say, you know what? I cannot sell it. It's not ready for sale. It's not ready for commercialization. Mm -hmm. That's wild. That's wild. And that's so poignant right now, again, because you know we have people with strategic distribution channels looking for white labeling. And it's funny, you almost reverse engineered it. Right. And, um, 
you know, it's, it's interesting. You probably have read this before. The first time entrepreneurs, they focus on the product, just like us. You build the product, spend the time, do other. Second time, focus on the go-to-market and Solution. growth and sales, mm -hmm. right? And they build the product later. Hmm. No code, low code. No code, low code, or uh, there's easy way now with all the technology frameworks available. You, If you have six customers signed up, to use your product, trust me, you can build a whole product for them and MVP in three months. <laughs> All right. So actually, so cool. that, I think that's a really good segue. I, I'd love to learn a little about like, so I'm assuming until uh, you, you said until Series A, you guys had five people. I'm, uh, the, at Seed, it was just you and your co-founder or did you have anybody else on the team? Uh, we had engineers. Okay, awesome. Um, and so what like once you guys hit series A, kind of tell us about what kind of people you had to focus on, like in order to take your company to the next level, right? Because sure. there's a lot of this generalist versus specialist kind of conversation yeah. too, and then what kind of person to to really bring on at that stage. Can you speak a little more towards that? Yeah, I would, you know, maybe we made, we didn't make the right decisions. We brought in more like uh product, uh, customer support, uh, customer onboarding. We focused on that and we did really well. We were very well, uh, we had a good reputation of uh, hand-holding customers and launching them and doing all that stuff, right? But looking back, I would say I would have invested more in sales and marketing, marketing automation and do all that stuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then how important is like, previous startup experience in let's say your first 10 or 20 employees or was it like a little more of also trusting people to wear multiple hats and getting things done um the um you know as as you grow from five to seven people you know then it it gets a little difficult you know not everybody is on the same page uh you cannot ask someone who just joined as a head of sales to do marketing. Uh, so you need to find those people who are understand how startups work and wear multiple mm -hmm. hats. Mm -hmm. um, so it, and then you know, you know, this is a funny story, but it's true. You know, uh, before the fundraising, you know, we when we would travel, we would stay at Motel Six or Day Inn, right? Sometimes share room. The day we raised the money and we had team, now everyone wants to stay at uh, Hilton and Sheraton and uh, you can't say anything to them, right? This is this is the norm, right? Yeah, we mm -hmm. did that when you we were working in our corporate life. Uh, so that's a transition that does, that will happen, you know, once you bring in people. Mm -hmm. uh, so you just need to be, you know, ready for that transition. Yeah, that's so that's nice. really interesting. Didn't even, yeah, I didn't even think about that to be candid because you know the founders lean, 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 eating shoe leather, and then it's like, well, actually, you have to pay yeah. normal salaries. They don't have the equity you have. You have to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, mm -hmm. Same same benefits that they had before. Um, yeah, so it's uh, yeah, mm. interesting. <laughs> yeah, oftentimes like people who or join you at like the series a or series b side can do even yeah. better than the the founders with cash and equity so it's, right. a, it's a good spot yeah but, we we would get creative by being like hey since we're all going together for this conference why don't we rent an airbnb mm -hmm. that will give us get time to be together <laughs> <laughs> how important are like your so advisors at the beginning Right. Especially as a young entrepreneur, or as a as a founder who's, you know, it, this, regardless if you have a tech background or not, but if you're building a company and even if you're getting to a seed or series A stage, like you get access to so many people, obviously, you know, bombarding you with, hey, you should be doing this, you should be talking to this, et cetera. How do you manage who to listen to? And then which ones in your experience were actually the most valuable to keep in touch with? Yeah, the advisor that who wrote the check, even if it's ten thousand dollars, I would take their advice seriously. Yeah. Right. So if someone is saying, you know, I want to be advisor, I know this market space, uh, they should write the check. Yeah, that may, makes all sense. Uh, you know, um, 
just narrowing it down to whoever <laughs> actually uh, follows through with you. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, well, Fahad, um, thank you. Just to kind of before we end things, so you you spoke to words about like if there are healthcare startups or even let's say uh, you know uh, startups who have made their first million dollars in annual revenue or ARR and are looking for somebody who can help on the distribution and on the tech side, they should contact you. On like. Do you, I, how, how should I word this? Like, would you prefer them to like contact you through LinkedIn? Is it usually that you go through like, a, you know, like we offer the concierge, we're going to be um, like listing you there. But otherwise, like what, uh, actually a better way to ask is what, how have the best startups that you work with found you in the first place and convinced you to work with them? Yeah, everywhere, you know, you can reach out to, they can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, through connections, I'm I'm open. Yeah. You know, I I, you know, you know, one of the things you know you learn as a founder is that you know, uh, you've been through the stages yourself, right? You're doing market research, you want to talk to advisors and stuff, and you don't like no because you needed it. So today, when if I can give them back, you know, I I try to take my time uh, that and help them as much as I can. Mm -hmm. So right. doesn't matter what uh, ARR they have. Mm -hmm. Awesome. No, I uh, thank you for mentioning that. And then um, final point. So uh, every entrepreneur also kinds of pays it forward by making introductions, right? And are there any kinds of startup communities or these kinds of organizations that you you work with focus on early stage companies or entrepreneurs that you would recommend? Uh, well, it, there are several. Uh, okay. Depends on <laughs> domain and. Uh... And uh, their services also ranges from what they offer. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can share that uh, some of those uh, in an email or something. Yeah, sounds good. We'll, we'll add it on later on. But Bahad, thank you again so much. Uh, this was a perfect time. Um, and we appreciate you taking the time to speak to us, uh, share your journey. Raj, any final comments? One last question. And I, I love how Guy Raz, uh, he, Guy Raz does this at How I Built This. Pahad, you're the man. Percentage wise, how much was luck and how much was just hard work? Yeah, I would say uh, 50 50. Okay. Love it. You gotta have a little of luck, huh? <laughs> a lot of luck. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much. Uh... Uh, to both of you for being with us, uh, for, for taking the time. Uh, for our viewers, uh, you know, thank you for joining. We're going to have another episode out next week. Uh, but if you're looking to get connected with people, specialists, advisors, fractional execs like Fahad or similar to him, come to check us out on our concierge. We'll be happy to hear what you're dealing with and make recommendations as necessary. But Great. Thank, thank you, you very much. All right. Have Thanks, Fahad. Appreciate the time. Thank Bye, you. Guys. Thank you. All right.